everybody good afternoon and uh, good day to all of you it's the last uh, day last thursday in month and it's time for the pan european conference on digital education my name is blanca tatzer and i am the moderator of the conference we will take this few minutes until the formal start of the conference just to present uh, all the presenters that are waiting uh, for us and for you all in the backstage. So I will present to them now. So the first presenter is Georgia, and we have Andre and Daniela, and Alina just managed to join us. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, the participants are uh, hardly wait for you to hear more about you. So please, Georgia, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you coming from? What do you teach? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with all of you today. I'm Georgia Manetta. I come from Greece and I work as an EFL teacher in a state primary school and also in three kindergartens. Uh, I consider myself a web tools lover, not a web tool expert. And I think that uh, new web tools uh, come every day so that uh, they can facilitate uh, our job and uh, the process of learning. Thank you very much. Georgia will share with us her experience uh, using Nearpod. Uh, and uh, now I greet uh, Andre. Hello. Hello, Blanca. Thank you very much for welcoming me here. Um, uh, I come from... Uh, Malta. Uh, I teach music in uh, middle school, Kirkop, St. Benedict's Middle School, where we have taken up an Erasmus project dealing with multiculturalism. It is a topic which is very much at heart for me because I am half Maltese, half Italian myself, have lived the experience on both ends. And uh, we have seen the influx of a lot of migrant students and together with partners from Slovenia, from Turkey and from Lithuania, we have uh, helped to discover how the teacher in schools can deal with multiculturalism leading to interculturalism and a better form of integration during this project. Okay. Thank you. We will hear more about uh, their project and also about the teaching strategies they used uh, later on during the conference. Uh, hello, Daniela, also to you. So here is your voice from Romania. Thank you very much for coming and please tell us a little bit about yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. I am happy to be here with you. Uh, as you said, I come from Romania. I teach English at a state uh, high school, Petra Ketrishku Sports High School. Literature is my passion. Uh, that is why I thought that uh, I could uh, share a little bit of this uh, passion with you today. More, I will develop more on the subject when the time will be just right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Alina, good day to you. Hi. Good day to Sweden. Hi. Uh, hello. Hi. Just uh, yeah, tell also you a little bit about yourself. 
Thank you so much for inviting me here. I live in uh, Sweden and I work in Folk Universität in uh, Uppsala. This is an adult educational organization with uh, um, roughly 100 years of experience uh, of uh, providing adult education uh, in Sweden. And uh, I work specifically in the Department for International Cooperation and we run around 50 different Erasmus projects and uh, my specific field is uh, innovative methods in education and uh, specifically uh, digital direction. So I will be very glad to share our latest uh, innovations and tools uh, in this um, conference. Thank you. Looking forward also to your uh, presentation. So, uh, and with us uh, will also be Natalia Palcic from Croatia, but she will come a little bit later. Uh, so, we will start. I will present uh, the conference program once again so that you can see it uh, also in the written. Uh, so, uh, in a minute, we will start with uh, Georgia, who will present us near pot. So, how to create an amazing lesson in a few minutes. Uh, then uh, Andre, as uh, mentioned, he will present the project Strife and teaching strategies they used towards radical intercultural values education. Uh, Daniela will follow with her presentation on interactive tools for teaching English literature online. Uh, and then Natalia Palcic will follow with a presentation on financial literacy of young people. Uh, and we conclude by Alina with her presentation on digital upskilling and motivating low skill young adults. So I think uh, it's a really interesting program ahead of us. So turn on your ears and your hearts and uh, we will be happy to share all the knowledge of our valuable presenters today. Uh, I will put, uh, so all the participants of the conference uh, uh, are having an opportunity to receive a certificate of uh, attendance. I will put uh, the link in which you can request the certificate of uh, participation uh, into the chat. I will put uh, it there in a minute, uh, in a minute when I will stop talking. Uh, uh, but you can also find all the slides uh, of the presenters on the Facebook group Pan-European uh, Conference on Digital Education. So the slides are on the Facebook group. The link for the certificate will be in the comments. Uh, and I hope that I will also see your questions in the comments. So you are invited to listen the presentation very carefully and then ask everything you are interested in and our presenters will uh, share their experience and knowledge with uh, you. So uh, then, yeah, it's time, go ahead then. So the first presentation is uh, by Georgia. Uh, we will listen to her on the near pod. So please, the stage is yours, Georgia. Okay, here I am. I'm trying to share my screen. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Okay, and we will wait, of course. Is it okay? Is it, can you uh, see it? Yes, we see it. Yes, it's a near pod uh, web page. Okay, awesome. Um, so, hello everyone. I decided not to create um, a PowerPoint presentation. I would like to show everything that happens uh, live. In 10 minutes it will be difficult, but anyway, I'll give my best. So, uh, I have already logged in my account. Uh, you may start by uh, signing up using uh, your uh, uh, Gmail or uh, any other email. Uh, mind you that now it will ask for your uh, school email address. Just keep that in mind. And I would also like to show you that my uh, account is silver, which means it's a free plan, and it allows you to have lessons up to 100 megabytes, which means after this you cannot have, um, you cannot create any more lessons. Uh, you either go and uh, go towards the gold, um, a gold, let's say, account, or you just stay there and try to delete things. 
but creating an airport lesson it's so easy that you can do it in a few minutes so i'm logged in i'm going to create you can go either from here or from here you can create either a lesson with activities videos etc a, a video with uh, you know built-in questions or an activity just to have let's say a short quiz as a warm-up or a quiz as an exit uh, test at the end of uh, a lesson or you can also uh, import uh, google slides so what i'll try to do now is create a lesson i'm going to create and uh, i'll say here test for conference uh, i would like to add a content so what i do is the first one is that I want to create a slide just to uh, say what my lecture is about. And I also want, let's say, you, I can either upload a movie, a PNG or a JPG. I can find something here or I can upload files from my uh, computer. I can also change the format like a typical uh, PowerPoint. I use this one. I like it best. So. If I go here, I can add a text again, an image, a GIF, a video. I'll go here and you can see that not only you can upload it from your Google Drive or your Dropbox or from your computer, you can also um, search on Google. So let's say um, flags, something that comes to mind now. I don't know why. And wow, I like um, this one and I save it and it's there. I can uh, zoom it out, zoom it in, etc. So I save it and I go on and then I want to add a new one. And for example, I want you can see here it says content and activities. Blanca, by the way, if you see that I'm over the time, just let me know. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, so uh, if I add content, I have these things I can add. I can add a slide, as I told you, where you can have a text explaining to your students what they have to do, or a video, or web content, an image, or a, a YouTube uh, link, etc. 3D, BBC videos, a sway that you have created, a slideshow, a VR field trip, which is on paid version, the, the most, um, you know, um, the better, um, how to say it, you can make the most of it uh, when it's a, a paid um, version, an audio, a PDF viewer, etc. However, if you go to activities, you can um, add open-ended question, which can be used, for example, at the beginning. So, for example, now, if I add an, op an open-ended question, I can ask, how are you feeling today? And... I add the timer. For example, I want my students to uh, to have it to answer it uh, uh, in two minutes. And I can also enable student uh, recordings. For example, instead of uh, writing, they can record and save. So here it is, the second slide. If I don't like the order of my slides, I can go like this. So this is the first slide and this is the second one. If I want to add a new one and I'll go to activities, which is like a quiz, I could do, for example, matching pairs. What is this? Match the correct word. Match um, the word to the correct image. And for example, we have the word apple. And I want to add an image and it saves me again because I don't have to go and save my. We have apples. I go this one, take this one. So I have my first pair ready. Come on. So I have to add another. Um, uh, another. Yeah. There, I don't like this one. Okay, so in matter of seconds, you also have another activity done and save. Don't forget, save. 
So, oh, I don't like this. So this is my first, but I want the matching pair to be here. I can drag and drop the slides whenever I want. So I have um, uh, a lesson like this. I can also add, let's say, another one. What do I have to add? I can add uh, a video. Um, I can add a video from uh, uh, the Nearpod lesson library. I can add a video that I have on my computer or a YouTube video. Um, <laughs> I did that today with my kids. So I'll try to find something here. Let's say this one. Yes. Uh, I, I think it's good. That's what they are asking us. So I save it. And yeah, it's here. I can also trim it if you see here. So this is the video. So in a matter of seconds, I have everything that I need for a lesson together with um, written instructions, uh, with some theory, let's say, grammar, and also some quizzes, open-ended questions, matching pairs, quizzes. I can also add a video from Flipgrid, a collaborate board. It's like the Padlet where you ask your students to write something about, let's say, themselves. Draw it, activity, filling the blanks, memory test, the one that we use with our uh, children, younger children, etc. So now that I have finished, let's say, my lesson, I save and exit. And you can see it here. Waiting, waiting. While it's being loaded and being saved, uh, you can give this lesson either by with live participation, which means that now that I'm online, I can give you a code and you can join my lesson and we can do the activities together. Or you can give it as a student based lesson as homework. So, for example, if you have taught them the difference between uh, simple present and present continuous. Uh, so, so then you give them two quizzes uh, created on your pod and you send them uh, at home. Uh, you know who has done uh, the, the activities or not or and not who for example i know that blanca is not a very good student by clicking on reports blanca <laughs> it's uh, just for fun you know and <laughs> here, here are all my um are all my uh lessons and i can see that in this session i had 28 students participating in this one 50 students and then i can click and see the names so this is one thing. So remember that uh, Nearpod lessons can be done either live or as homework. Also, Nearpod library. See how easy you can do some things. Let's say that I want to do something about Black History Month, but I don't have time. I go and see this. Um, here, this one. And... Uh, okay, let's uh, see this. And... I can preview the lesson. It's they are ready made, les made, made lessons. I can preview them. I can pre preview the videos, etc. You can see here that it stops because there are questions. And as soon as I like it, but what I want to do to show you something else that uh, why uh, I can add it to my lessons, which means that I take it, that I take it from the library and I can do it my own. Why I'm saying this? because you'll see it here. I can edit it. Oh, it's a video, I can't. Anyway, if I find, I'm trying to find something that has, not videos. Mm, okay. Okay, let's say this. I like this lesson, let's say, and I add it to my library, to myself. Why I do that? Because as soon, I can pre you can preview if you like uh, the lesson or not, and you think it's good. So you go to your library, and you can edit the lesson. You can do it your own, which means that you can uh, keep it as it is, or you can uh, delete a slide that you don't like. For example, I don't like this, so I delete it or I don't like the order, so I can do anything I want. So you can find ready-made lessons. You can add them to your library. You can
delete the slides that you don't like. You can add slides to the ones you like. And the, the only problem here is that you cannot edit a slide. For example, I cannot edit it, write something different, but I can edit the activities. For example, I can edit uh, the collaborate board if I don't like the question, etc. cetera. Uh, teacher resources uh, are where, I have them in my presentation as well, are uh, where teachers can go in order for uh, uh, to get better help from Nearpod. And there are also live webinars that have to do with uh, beginners in Nearpod, etc. Don't uh, forget about these teacher resources. Uh, so, and for example, here I have a lesson about Easter. And what I did, I can show you my preview, is that I have the first slide. I have a video about the uh, Easter customs in the UK. And then I have uh, a matching activity. And then I have a time to climb, which is a great game because children are getting in the game in the form of avatar and they have to answer the questions. And whoever asks, uh, answers the question, the fastest and, of course, the correct one goes to the top of a hill. And you can see all the children running in their avatars. Really fun. And then I have uh, added a board where children can answer what they have learned from the video. And then I have added a song that I like very much. And then I have added a fill-in activity. So I can do it now with you or I can set it home for my students. And that's it. So remember, ah, and also uh, don't forget that Nearpod cannot be accessed without internet connection, but you can download your lessons into a PDF form. Don't forget that the free uh, account gives you up to, see, now it's uh, fuller because I have added uh, this thing, I can delete it, easy. Uh, don't forget uh, that uh, you only have 100 uh, megabytes in the free version. It's, it's worth buying the full one if you think that you will use it fully. Uh, you have the Nearpod library, uh, which can help you uh, have a ready-made lesson, and you can also edit it, uh, delete slides, rearrange the slides, and edit the, the activities in it. Uh, you can have the teacher resources, which will help you um, uh, with uh, the beginnings of uh, Nearpod. You can add YouTube videos, uh, you can add uh, PDFs, you can add web content. For example, we know live worksheets uh, helps us a lot with question, with exercises. You can add the specific web uh, link to a live worksheet inside a Nearpod lesson, and you can enjoy Nearpod live with your students or as homework. I don't think I have forgotten something. I'm sorry if I was really, really fast, but I got really. Um... Yeah, so thank you yeah, for the presentation. Uh, it was uh, great. And uh, uh, I know that you already told us about uh, how to use the Nearpod, uh, but uh, there are questions by the participants whether this account is free. So can you get by as a teacher with a free account or you, do you okay. necessarily have to buy in order no. to be able as a, to? As I mentioned, yeah. uh, the free account gives you up to 100 megabytes, which is, it depends on the use you're doing, you're having with Nearpod. Mm -hmm. So you saw that as soon as I took a, a video out of the library lesson, uh, I almost reached the limit. So what they have to do is to be, uh, you know, really careful with the, the free space and they can create lessons in a matter of um, minutes. So for me, I wouldn't worry. I could delete the lesson and prepare a new one again, etc. cetera. Uh, however, buying it is a very good investment, especially for children, for uh, educators who use both uh, live and uh, online teaching nowadays. And I think it's the future of education after all, the, the future of teaching. Uh, my Michaela would like to know whether also the students need to have an account or just no. the teacher. No, uh, I wish I, we would have more time for this. Uh, as soon as uh, I go to live uh, participation, uh, there is a code. So the students go to app.nearpod join or something like this, I don't remember. So they just put in the, the code and they go in 
and uh, they uh, they are together with uh, the teacher doing the exercises or at home the code that you will give them is just a link and they click on it and they just write um, the answers to the questions that you have uh, provided to them. Just ask your students not to uh, join a lesson uh, using uh, a nickname. For example, I had uh, Ronaldo inside and I told them, hey, I don't know who Ronaldo is. I don't have a Ronaldo in my classroom. So you have to write Blanca, let's say, or Andre or anything so that I know that Blanca Yes, she did the activities that I asked. It's a really uh, good way of um, testing your students and a really great way of, um, uh, you know, teaching your students with. Uh, thank you for the great comments. It's, it was really short time and I hope you can find my presentation on Facebook um, interesting. Uh, yeah, at least. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you for mentioning it. So all the presentations on, are on the Facebook uh, group Pan European Conference on Digital Education. Uh, Georgia, thank you for this really useful and brief presentation. Thank so you for now, having me. Thank you. So now we move uh, to Malta. Uh, hello once again. Uh, Andre is uh, with us. Uh, and Andre will present us the project Strive Strategies Towards Radical Intercultural Values uh, in Education. So would you like to share your slides with us? Absolutely. Thank you very much, first and foremost. Um, let's see that this is in order. Are you seeing the presentation? Okay, yes. We yes. see. Good. So, strive strategies towards radical intercultural values in education. It seems a very bombastic name, but in reality, it is with a very clear intent of helping non local students integrate in our schools and in our society at the very basis of it. This was a two year program. Erasmus Kirch 2009, which uh, ended last December, started in 2019, and by default was severely hit by the pandemic, as all the rest of the world was. There were four schools involved, St. Benedict's College, the school in Kirkop, which was the school I am representing, which were the leaders of the project, Klaipedios, Prano Masiotto Pro Gymnasia Kleipeda, Lithuania, Brekete di Burge Orta Oculus Elispari in Turkey, Osnova Novna Sola Brzin of Novo Mesto, Slovenia. Apologies for my diction in that regard. So these four schools get up to discuss the issues and the difficulties of multiculturalism. And basically, uh, it started off with our school where we realized that in the academic year 2018-19, there was a group of non-local students who started gathering um, and getting off the others, the locals, with, during breakdowns in particular. And we realized that this, if not tackled efficiently as a whole school, could become a problem where segregation could become an issue. Uh, in doing so, we started brainstorming possibilities of how to tackle the differences between cultures and to avoid segregation between students. And the opportunity came up to get into an Erasmus project of the sort. So re the questions which led to this project were how do educators in other European and non-European countries tackle multiculturalism in schools? How do they tackle and avoid segregation? And what can the teacher and the educational institution do to reduce and prevent segregation or even conflict, which at times, unfortunately, did appear? In Muta, we have had a very rapid influx of non-locals, uh, which has left the teachers many times unprepared. So uh, 
those agreements, uh, we started off with the application, defined them in those objectives, found our partners, and entered the, the responsibilities to get into the project. I would like to thank from here uh, the leaders of each of the schools, therefore Ms. Bekiner Turk, Ms. Natalia Globevnik, Ms. Virgina Kerkodim, Kerdokine, from the partner schools who have done an astounding amount of work and has been sterling because due to the pandemic, as you will see later on, it has been very much jeopardized in certain aspects, but we have turned this threat into an opportunity. And I would like to thank all the team members in our school St. Benedict's. So the focus of the whole project was originally to start off and do job uh, and attend courses, initially attend courses, one organized in Malta and one organized by Primera Group who are hosting us here today and uh, get teacher training for us to disseminate within the school. However, um, uh, there were two handbooks to be written, one which was for teachers and one which was for students. When the pandemic hit, we realized that the knowledge that we had learned over the two courses was of excellent quality. And since the job shadowing experiences of observing students in other countries could not occur as wished, we reverted to some of our lecturers, Dr. Viviana Premazzi, who has lectured us here in Malta, Ms. Petra Zalocnik, who has lectured us through the Primera group, and Ms. Don Agingel, who is a clinical psychologist who we have contacted directly, who came up with this uh, booked for teachers. So in this way, the project, even though we could not uh, attend and visit each other's schools and take learning experience from that aspect, uh, the drive was to create this handbook as a guide for teachers who would like to learn more about intercultural values in education and how to tackle a multicultural classroom. Now, <coughs> apologies. Um, uh, we took a further step because it was originally intended to be written in English and originally only by the teachers from their experience, but seeing the importance and the strategies given, which were so valid, it was translated into each of the languages, Lithuanian, Moldy, Slovenian, and Turkish. Basically, the main points and the main chapters of the booklet focus as follows. Why the integration of immigrant children is important, different methods of integration and support from multicultural to intercultural paradigm of integration, preparation for the integration of immigrant students, which is highly important, integration of immigrant children into the education system, strategies and resources, uh, creating a welcoming environment for immigrant students, emotional and psychological well-being of students, and finally, the school and the community which all together link into a very effective methods, raise uh, ways and methods to get into this ideal because it becomes a school policy. Actually, it is interesting that the book opens with this statement. It takes a village to raise a child from an African proverb and from these experiences, from uh, teaching multicultural classrooms, yes, I can see that that is a major thing to do. So, um, uh, one thing which many times we do not give enough importance to when a non-local student comes into the school is that we tend to forget that the child 
has social emotional needs and uh, the child many times as we will see would have left the country of origin not always for choice or even if there would be a choice there would still be certain elements of difficulties found um, uh, key contributors to successful integration in the educational system would be the, the fellow students themselves, the locals, the parents, the teachers, and society in general. Now, as regards to the students, the teacher's role is very important to prepare both local students who would be receiving the non-local students as well as non-local students together with the parents included. Therefore, this originally starts off as a school-based approach, and we are very much focusing on that, but eventually it becomes a whole social thing. And one of the sections in the, the book here says that the school is an important socialization agency and plays the roles of transmitting cultural heritage shaping and developing the human capital of the young generations. However, the expectations towards the scholastic institution and its capacity, both as a trainer and promoter, of equal opportunities are often disregarded. Many times, teachers find themselves not being able to communicate, particularly when there are language barriers with students, to see how to integrate and help the more local within the um, society. If the school community, the classroom community, starts with the acceptance, understanding, and integration <clears throat> within the local dimension, there we start off in the uh, in a good shape. There are different methods. We've got the integrated more mainstream students would be joined by the non-locals and it would be a whole one group without making any kind of distinction, which would be ideal as an arrival point. However, there is a separate model which leaves certain groups of students who are from different cultures and different nationalities separate from the rest of the classes and schools. It sometimes works in short term, particularly in the, in the introduction of a new local, and then eventually in the long term. And the holistic model, which is so very important, where uh, all the needs, learning, social and emotional are addressed. This obviously means that in the classroom, lesson adaptations must be made and we must be careful of how to use certain things. Now, in saying so, let us be aware that this is not uh, some kind of trap, but anything but. Let us use different culture nomenclatures. Let us use language which can be understood by everybody. Uh, be considerant when we do tackle sensitive topics. Um, finding the common ground rather than the difference. When there is a difference, not the creation of the us against them, but a mutual understanding and dialogue for a more holistic understanding of things. Um, also, one thing which is found as being helpful is uh, a moment where the student, non local students may find their, uh, mo their, their corner of uh, reconnection to their, to their mother tongue, to their homeland, would be finding books within the library or organized language clubs which may enhance these opportunities. Thus, uh, adaptations of the lesson material has said, creating a safe space. It is important that when a new student comes into the school, uh, he or she would be 
made to feel at ease. And the facilitation of uh, non-teachers or teachers who come from different cultures gets already the idea of uh, school being directly integrating this approach. The title refers to interculturalism rather than multiculturalism. And uh, here is uh, the definition of the two, which we applied to the students' booklets, um, where multiculturalism remains separate and live alongside one another without too much interaction, whereas interculturalism, despite keeping the roots, enhances a deep understanding and respect for the differences and celebrates them. Uh, with new ownership in the cultural setting. So this is something which is uh, becomes a school policy and an approach. Some things which may occur in some cases, you may find schools where linguistic support may be offered. This is not always the case. Um, uh, the handbook describes even situations where parents will be involved in this and... Uh, native language would be used, but it is something which not, is not always practical for schools to be used. Parental involvement is very crucial. However, the pandemic, unfortunately, has limited a lot under this point of view. Um, uh, I don't want to repeat myself. Now, psychological well-being and emotional, this is something which is crucial because uh, there are elements of trauma suffered by students, by any non-local student, because the movement, the migration element, is something which, whether it is wanted or unwanted, for example, refugees fleeing from zones of conflict, um, or parents finding work opportunities, the attachment developed and the bonds and the friendships developed by the children who would be on the move, leaving behind their native land, would create an element of trauma, no matter what, which uh, at times manifests itself either through uh, the child being much more reserved or not socializing that much or being um, aggressive or having emotional turmoils. The student's booklet was developed in part of this project and now go lead into certain things done during the project itself. In this case, I'm presenting our school's booklets where there are general formation, uh, introduction to the school, the system, etc., etc. So the first mobility, we had the opportunity to do it physically pre-COVID, and uh, basically started off in December 2019. We had three lecturers, Dr. Gloria borchak Cesar, Dr. Viviana Premazzi, who was one of the authors of the booklet, the handbook, and Dr. Maria Gabriel Dabelson, who gave us a good understanding in the first uh, week of the mobility. And we had also the opportunity to visit uh, the Maria Regina Hub, which is a school dedicated for international students who do not possess the adequate skills of English language and Maltese language to be in a mainstream. In this school, uh, this is a very good example of multiculturalism within a school. Uh, the teachers teach English and Maltese together with other elements of the curriculum so that the students at the end of the year would be reinserted into the mainstream schools. We visited Maria Regina Middle School because there is a high concentration of non-locals over there. Um, here are some photos. I'll go briefly through them with the partners during lectures and uh, with addresses along this whole week of activities where teachers had the opportunities to uh, observe lessons, partners, and we had uh, the various conferences going on along. And something which was interesting was that the project enabled the schools to link up with 
local communities such as NGOs and uh, local councils. Here we are in uh, Maria Regina and the, the element of traditional um, uh, food and postcards sent to the various countries. These are the Malta postcards sent over with discussions and activities and lessons being done about multicultural settings. So in the various subjects, the teachers started exploring multiculturalism and uh, I, teaching music, happened to use the music, traditional music of various places as part of the research being done, uh, where the multicultural team was embedded into the curriculum itself. Um, an art competition for the logo that you're seeing at the top left of the uh, of your screen was done, and uh, this was done across the schools. However, the winner happens to be, in our school, happened to be Gabriel Borda with the logo and the prizes accordingly. The second mobility should have been hosted by a Primera Group who are hosting us right now virtually, and we happened to be hosted in the same way. Originally, it was to be held in uh, March 2020, just before the lockdowns in Europe. And we had a very successful venture, and it was one of the first ventures we experienced with online and remote working. I'd like to thank the lecturers, Monica Spita, um, Petra Zalochnik, Dr. Anisa Mikushkos, and Kaya Herzog who have been fundamental in teaching us a lot of skills in uh, the use of um, the teacher in the intercultural settings in the multicultural classroom and how to adopt very uh, specific skills, which were also written in the book by Petra Zalochnik herself. And here are some photos of various uh, situations in that. And then we went to the virtual mobilities. We could not unfortunately observe physically, but we had to connect and uh, discuss matters online with our partner schools and gave us a lot of very valuable information from the lessons learned as they went along with traditions, but obviously the connection that could have been uh, gathered by the live experience uh, was very well merged, not merged, I uh, can't find the correct words, replaced by this virtual experience. Eventually, <laughs> we had an official launch of our booklets given out to the media. And this is a very valuable tool to be used in our schools. Um, if any one of you would like any more information in regards to how to open a booklet, on the screen you're seeing the dedicated Gmail accounts, which we are using right now. Um, uh, we are in the days of concluding the final report itself and as regards to the web uh, the, the web possibility and facility, it is something which we are exploring at present to settle our infrastructures in regards. Are there any questions? me stop Hi. sharing yes. from this point of view. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, actually, Thanks. Jana would like to know, are there any effective methods to assess to what extent the interculturalism has been embedded into students' values and how long does it usually take? Any thoughts on that? So, this is a very good question, and I would like to thank you for the question. Um, uh, I can talk about the experience in our school. Our school happens to be a middle school 
receiving students aged 11, 13. So they, their lifespan within our school is of only two years. Therefore, um, uh, we have to be very efficient in, in helping the non-local students settle into the school. Um, uh, it's done, the, the idea originally pre-COVID was to do it both on individual scale and as a general school approach with activities done as a whole school approach. But as you very well know, the restrictions and the bubbles have impeded that. Therefore, we had to go on a more one-to-one uh, -one or small groups approach relating particularly with the uh, students themselves. And it is something which has worked under this point of view because um, one of the most beautiful comments that I received from a teacher, a colleague of mine, who happens to uh, teach ethics, therefore is in direct contact with non-locals, with a number of non-locals, uh, one of the comments said by one student who I do not happen to teach said that uh, in the middle school they feel much more welcomed than and you do not feel that much the difference in relations to the primary school. And this honestly um, gave me one of the greatest satisfaction under this point of view. We have... Uh, two classes, one per year, which is more concentrated with non-locals than other classes. And we've got others who are sparse here and there. It has been done, apart from different academic levels, it has been done even as part of the project in itself. Therefore, to see and analyze and understand if the no locals all together with the locals themselves create that uh, synergy. And I must say that over the past two years, thanks to the various things that we have learned and the appreciation of the cultures and the, the mutual understanding, we have found that the students' morals, the objectives and which we had set under the non-tangible part of the project have been very much achieved. It is not simple to achieve such results and it requires a lot of time. I mean, if you had to ask me directly if uh, you would, I would be satisfied after the two years, I tell you not yet because there is a lot to do the topic is a hot issue topic in Europe because the intercultural movement has seen a lot of migration, a lot of movements between countries and it's something which is here to stay because uh, we are no longer confined by our national boundaries. Thus, uh, the mutual understanding of the different cultures is something which needs to be promoted under this point of view. Um, uh, many times the assessment of how it has been embedded is seen through behaviors and approaches and language used by students themselves. Therefore, when there was that element of zero violence, zero tolerance towards violence, um, I must say that I have heard many less comments which were of uh, demeaning nature, particularly between different culture group of students. Whereas in reality, there's a very big support which is generated because the cultural awareness of the teacher and the treating everybody equally without any distinction under this point of view and the asking to get to know more about the background and the culture of the students that is something which enables a lot because it starts setting the student at ease and there is a
mutual understanding which gets eliminates that uh, bias or that preconception that might have been beforehand. I hope I answered the question. Thank you very much, Andre. And uh, your presentation is now relevant more than ever. Already the participants reminded us about the Ukraine and this sad day today. So thousands of people, uh, immigrants from Ukraine will enter Poland and Romania, Hungary and all the neighboring countries. Yes. So I think all the information you provided uh, is really valuable. Let us, uh, so, Blanca, I would you. like to, to just put, put one thing in this, in this regard. I would, I would like to um, uh, give my warm regards to the neighboring countries hosting the Ukrainian refugees. And I would like to send my very warm regards and prayers to the Ukrainian friends who are fleeing their country because of war conflict. Let us bear in mind that from a day to the next, we had people living their normal life and suddenly finding themselves without home, without uh, the basic needs, without any kind of support that should have been and could have been in the situation. Therefore, we need to understand the psychological background that there would be. So we are no longer to discussing about students within a classroom and a list of students. But in reality, we are talking about the human being experiencing this kind of trauma. And we have to bear in mind that there are so many consequences which are underlying within our classroom. So it is up to us to level all of these situations and stories to our fellow uh, colleagues and students. Thank you very much. Yes, one bad decision led to all this, and I hope uh, it will end as soon as possible. So let's hope. Let's hope. Um, OK, but uh, now I can say that um, the literature is also one way to you know to become more tolerant uh, to become more even more human i would say so uh, daniela your, it's your turn daniela will present us interactive tools for teaching english literature online i saw some of her tools before before the start of the conference. So I think uh, that you also have a really nice contribution. I'm looking forward. Yes, uh, thank you once again. Can you hear me well? Everything is well, yeah. The sound is well and uh, we also see the presentation. Good, good, just a second. Okay. So, uh, as you said, the title of my uh, presentation today is uh, um, Interactive uh, Tools for Teaching uh, English. Uh, what I uh, would like to share with you is the fact that I love literature and uh, I find teaching literature very challenging. As we all know, for the last two years, both uh, teachers and students have been teaching and learning online. Therefore, I also had the opportunity to uh, engage in a massive online course delivered by the uh, Embassy of the United States of America. Uh, there were five positions for Romania. We had to apply with a CV and a letter of intention. And uh, I was selected to take part in this course. I uh, selected the content-based uh, uh, approach on literature. Actually, the course was divided into uh, two main uh, categories, an online orientation course that I attended in March 2021 and an online basic training course uh, that I attended from April to June uh, 2021. 
I finished uh, the course with a distinction for uh, demonstrated excellence, which provided me the opportunity to become a member of the American community of teachers. Therefore, I'm still uh, in touch with them, attending workshops, very inspirational workshops, and also having the opportunity to uh, participate to their uh, uh, international magazine forum. The most important thing is what I could apply from the American uh, teaching system to the Romanian teaching system. And indeed, uh, there were lots of things. I won't insist very much on CBI today, just I want to um, to specify the fact that CBI uh, places an emphasis on using the language rather than on talking about it. And uh, learners construct knowledge and develop understanding about a topic and the learning task. Learners are motivated to use language meaningfully. Context is a natural stimuli for linguistic input and it is the stage for learning. Regarding the American way, uh, we should bear in mind the fact that self-reflection on papers submitted is essential. We as teachers uh, had to engage in a profound uh, reflection on our papers and to deliver um, constructive feedback to our uh, uh, teacher fellows. Tackling the problem, the multiple perspective leads to an utter understanding of methodological concepts Take one step at a time, not much content at once. New notions are simply explained and then applied to various learning contexts. This is something that is uh, very important. So we try to develop our students' competences and not just one type of uh, learning or teaching activity. We have to use as many as uh, many teaching activities as possible in order to address the multiple intelligences in our um, classrooms and every individual student. So, uh, metaphorically, uh, about the content, we should say that we have to take one sip at a time and, not, and then toss the coin, I thought. Uh, that's why I have the image of Janus, who is the god with two faces. Uh, this is something that is very important. And now, briefly, uh, some things about uh, teaching literature. Teaching literature is a very complex process, and within a classical approach, uh, teachers um, usually follow several stages, and these are pre-reading activities, while reading activities, and post-reading activities. The pre-reading activities have the purpose to raise students' interest, to engage students in the reading activity, and to familiarize students with a topic or the theme, to build connections, and to use background knowledge. The most important types of activities uh, could be brainstorming ideas, discussion, analyzing a quote, using video and audio material, skimming the text and making predictions, analyzing the title, analyzing the pictures and guessing the topic. The while reading activities have uh, as a main purpose the development of the reading competence and we have two micro reading skills which are reading for gist and reading for details. Some of the activities that teachers could apply in their class classrooms are confirming predictions, answering reading comprehension, literal and inferential questions, vocabulary or grammar exercises, or the analysis of register, style and the moral message of the fictional text. The post-reading activities uh, have as main purposes uh, to, to make connections between the fictional world and the real world of the reader and to make use of the real value of the text in various contexts. Teachers could uh, develop some, such things through creative writing, finding related news, preparing a survey or having students quizzing their classmates. So this would be the, the classical approach, let's say. But today I'm going to share with you a modern approach in which, of course, I have inserted various teaching tools for different uh, stages of the teaching learning process. 
And the content that I worked on is Mark Twain's novel, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Mark Twain is America's best storyteller from my point of view, a writer of the 19th century, whose real name is Samuel Langhorne Clemens. Uh, he was a very complex personality because he was a riverboat pilot, a journalist, a writer, a humorist, even inventor, publisher and lecturer. Uh, his uh, pen name, Mark Twain, is actually a Mississippi River term associated with the second mark on the line that measured depth. That was about uh, 3.6 meters depth. Uh, about uh, the novel, uh, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, uh, we could uh, say that it is a Bildungsroman novel, an adventure novel. It is written in American Southern and uh, it incorporates some black dialects of the 19th century. It is narrated from Huck's point of view. The tone is ironic and contemplative and the setting is between the Civil War somewhere between 1835 and 1845. And the themes are racism and slavery, intellect intellectual and moral education, the hypocrisy of civilized society. Some of those uh, themes are still actual today. Now, regarding online presentation tools, in the first stage, that is the teaching process itself, we could use uh, various um, IT tools like Prezi, Padlet, online videos, and the Project Gutenberg site. And I'm going to just... Um, uh, change a little bit my uh, my screen to go there. I would like to show you first of all that we have a great uh, online library which is Gutenberg and here all students and teachers can find the text of the novels as they were initially read. So these are the authentic texts and I strongly recommend all my students to check the site and to read from here. Then to go back to uh, my uh, presentation just in a moment. Another uh, important and uh, interesting tool in this case is one of these sites that I found as uh, Mark Twain's uh, house in Connecticut. Uh, he has a beautiful house um, uh, there. It is actually a museum now. It is a house in the Victorian style and the students uh, really enjoy um, this virtual tour of the house because as you can see there are many moving images and uh, they can easily connect it with their games, the games they usually play. And on this topic we can enlarge, we can work on vocabulary, um, related to house and house furniture and uh, architectural styles, why not? Uh, we could uh, uh, write, um, uh, we could develop writing activities, for instance, describe your house or describe uh, uh, the ideal house or the eco-friendly house, an IT, uh, an intelligent house, let's say. So there are numerous activities that we could uh, work from this point on. Um, okay, then uh, also in the teaching phase, we could use uh, Prezi in order to present the writer using infographics. I have some print screens of the infographic right now. As you can see, uh, this is a very interesting tool because it helps students to organize information logically in a simple way. For instance, we have uh, information regarding um, his uh, activity as a writer. We could have some uh, quotes. Uh, we could even have images related to his house in Connecticut. Then the second uh, stage uh, of the activities are the learning, uh, are those that are incorporated into the learning process. Now, what I have here is an example of content-based learning applied uh, on literature. The level of students um, should be B1. And um, it, 
during the the course that I uh, attended online, we usually wrote some learning objectives. There were uh, there were two categories of objectives: language learning objectives and content learning objectives. But of course, those objectives address competences, general competences, and uh, specific competences. So by the end of the vocabulary activity, the students will be able to provide synonyms for the topic uh, selected words in the given text, write sentences of their own using the new words, use a new vocabulary in group discussions about the character in the book, use past tense in active voice to speak about their childhood memories. Content learning objectives, by the end of the unit, students will be able to identify the narrative perspective of the novel, give reasons why the novel is a Bildungsroman, identify instances of the unreliable narrator in the text, explain dramatic irony as it occurs in the novel, identify figures of speech and stylistic elements related to the orality of the style, compare adventures from the text with their own childhood memories, narrate and describe funny childhood memories to their colleagues. Now, we could uh, have a handout. Uh, the task would be read the following excerpt from The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn uh, by Mark, Tw Mark Twain and uh, pay attention to particular, uh, pay particular attention to the underlined words and try to infer the meaning from the context. We could uh, read the text either using British accent or American ac accent. We could use also videos online. I even found some videos. But anyway, my opinion is that if we read it uh, using the British accent, we will just uh, peel off the text from uh, its uh, American flavor. So. Um, uh, just a little bit from the text in order to get into the atmosphere. So it will it would go like that. You don't know about me without you have read uh, without you have read a book by the name of the Adventures of Tom Sawyer, but that ain't no matter. That book was made by Mr. Mark Twain, and he told the truth mainly. There was things which he stretched, but mainly he told the truth. That is nothing. I've never seen anybody but lie one time or another without it was Aunt Polly or the widow or maybe Mary, so on and so forth. Either we have our students reading the text silently or reading it loudly. Um, it, uh, it is uh, just our choice. Now, uh, one task would be working groups, read the sentences below and write at least one synonym for each underlined word. Let's make friends with a new word in three steps. And what I did was to write uh, three sentences. Uh, we have the same word, but in two uh, sentences, we have the word with the same meaning uh, as uh, the meaning in the text. And in another sentence, we have another meaning of the word. We just have students analyzing the context and inferring the meaning. For instance, stretch your arm no farther than your sleeve will reach. A great stretch of ocean lay beneath them. While telling the story, Grandma stretched some facts, but most of them were true. To stretch means. And students can either write it down on a sheet of paper or just completing in online, filling in all a form online. Uh, in an online uh, teaching approach, we would have a series of activities like this. Activity one would be a listening activity, uh, doing a listening uh, task on the text. Then activity two, uh, a reading activity for 10 minutes. Activity three, vocabulary activity, a quiz for 10 minutes on a Google platform. And activity four, personal dictionary design for 15 minutes. We have lots of online resources, online dictionaries like Cambridge, Oxford, and Macmillan, and uh, so on. So if we uh, decide uh, to work uh, on a quiz, we could uh, even write a quiz on the Google uh, Classroom platform. 
And here I have a print screen of such um, a quiz. Then another task could be design your own personal dictionary. You could use the following table as an example. And this is uh, something uh, original that I thought of and, I, and it was really appreciated. So in the first column we have the words party attire metaphorically speaking, because what I would ask my students to write down here is write the basic form of the words and any other useful forms you know. Then the words meaning write a short definition of the word using their own words, of course, not just copy paste from a dictionary. The words used write two sentences with a given word and the words personality reflect on the word what was more difficult form, meaning, or use. What do you like or dislike about the word? How often will you use this word? When will you use this word again? So reflection is in focus, uh, in focus here, and reflection is something that um, the American system of education really uh, considers is very important. To have students reflect on the learning, on, the, uh, on their own learning strategies, learning styles, on the content itself, it helps students internalize things better. The more we reflect and the more we tackle the same content um, through various uh, ways, um, the better it is, the more it stays with us. And then uh, the assessment process, I also uh, thought about some tools. I designed a Kahoot. Uh, which I'm going to, to find uh, right now here. So this is my, uh, my account, yes. And I uh, designed a 12 questions Kahoot with questions like that. What was uh, Mark Twain's real name? As a river term, how deep is Mark Twain? When did Mark Twain became a licensed river pilot, so on and so forth. And I also inserted some beautiful images in order to make it uh, more um, attractive, let's say, for the students. And here I also have some uh, some samples, some print uh, screens of the Kahoot because we do not have time right now to play it. And it's not the purpose of our of my presentation right now. Uh, so some of the slides would, uh, would look like that. Which story first brought fame to Mark Twain? And we have to choose the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Now, another interesting uh, online uh, tool with, uh, would be life worksheets. I'm sure that most of the teachers uh, have been uh, using this uh, resource. And uh, here I have um, a worksheet on Marx uh, Twain's uh, novels and his activity as a, a writer mainly. So after the students uh, carefully read the text, they would have to answer uh, multiple choice uh, questions like these. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn was Marx Twain's last book, true, false, not stated. Let's say they choose false, whatever. The writer took his pen name from working as an assistant to a publisher, false, so on and so forth. And after they uh, finish everything, um, they would just press finish and then they would have the possibility to um, get uh, the results uh, via email or uh, using their uh, phone uh, and their phone number. Yes. Okay, uh, here are some other slides uh, related to uh, the lesson plans, but I think uh, this is less important right now. And I would uh, actually conclude my uh, presentation with the words, uh, by three methods uh, we may learn wisdom. Firstly, by reflection, which is noblest. Secondly, by imitation, which is easiest. And thirdly, by experience, which is the bitterest. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you. And uh, also to this beautiful quote in the end, uh, I would love to be your student and experience all these rich materials that uh, you just presented. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you um, as well. Okay, and uh, now we move to Croatia. Uh, hello, uh, I greet here 
I think for the first time, Natalia, Natalia, hello, hello. Uh, Natalia will this time present us uh, an important topic for our youngsters, and that is financial literacy of young people. So would you like to share your slides? Yes. So how is it to talk about money with our children <laughs> looking forward just a second okay we will wait for a couple of seconds is uh, everything right with your connection natalia mm -hmm. Uh, let me check. Mm. He said here that it's uploading. Aha, okay, yes, you are sharing slides. So we will wait for a couple of uh, seconds and uh, then uh, and then proceed because yeah, if you choose the option to upload the slides, then it takes a little bit uh, longer. Okay. In the meanwhile, the participants are congratulating to our uh, Daniela. Would you like to do it instead of me? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Um, yes. Maybe to me. Yes, I will try. I will try. Just a second. Load file. It will be, we will see. Um, okay, it's still processing. It's still processing. Uh, I will give it to a couple of just seconds. Just a second, uh, it, I will try uh, to I do have something. It. Just a second. Uh, Natalia, I have your slides here. <laughs> Okay, so Natalia will just check the connection, uh, but maybe in the meanwhile, maybe um, okay, so maybe um, Alina, would you like to present in the meantime? Maybe we can go to your presentation if you wish and uh, we wait uh, for natalia to you know to to uh check her connection so sure okay. can you hear me yeah. yes i uh -huh. can hear you. Uh, i will try to share my okay so uh, natalia we just uh, went to alina's presentation uh so th to give you a couple is of it better now yes connection yeah uh so uh, uh natalia okay. we just went uh, on with alina so that she will present and in the meanwhile you can check your connection and later we will get back to you uh, so alina uh, is coming okay. from Folk university in Uppsala in sweden and her presentation is about digital upskilling and motivated low skill young adults so yeah mm -hmm. tell us your experience uh, yes. in this project i will share my screen mm -hmm. can you see my presentation yes you just put it on the presentation mode so that we will see the whole slides uh, can you see it now yeah yeah, yeah. yes Yes, uh, hi, thank you so much for welcoming here to this uh, conference. I will present our Erasmus Plus project, which is called Upskilling and Motivation uh, Young Adults Through Key Competences Online. And this project was uh, implemented by a Folk Universität with a partnership from four other European countries. And it is called ESTEP shortly. 
Uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Alina Vokuluk. I uh, am a project manager in uh, Folk Universität uh, in Uppsala, and I have been working with international projects for two years now. And um, uh, here you can see our website, and uh, you can use this link to check a little bit more. The general idea of Folk University and the motto is that uh, knowledge makes a difference. And um, why we are talking about digital education today, because it uh, grows and uh, it uh, turning, um, the education is turning into digital form more today at growing rate. And we need uh, tools to keep up with it and bring the most of it. And um, to speak about, um, there are different advantages and uh, challenges, of course, in digital education. Um, there are, of course, uh, pros such as easy access, it's flexible and progressive, and uh, we have much more different resources available online. Uh, it doesn't take so much uh, time to renew resources. It's much quicker and easier to make a new website or upload new information in the website. Uh, if you compare with printing your book or printing something physical. And uh, in some way, it can be quite helpful for learners with special needs, for example, learners with hearing issues or learners with uh, uh, memorizing or uh, attention issues. It can be quite, quite helpful. Uh, at the same time, there are different challenges, uh, for example, that we need to uh, learn for those tools which we are using online. We need to find a, spe a specific approach for some students with uh, special needs. And uh, what are we going to do with uh, learners of uh, different ages, like uh, seniors or maybe small children? Uh, how, are you, how are we going to approach digital education with them? There are a high risk for distractions when you are learning through your telephone or with your laptop. And also uh, the question is how do we approach teamwork issues, like how do we share groups or do mini groups or how are we doing this uh, uh, non-verbal communication. This is a great challenge when speaking about digital education. Uh, so, in order to approach uh, to this and uh, answer to those challenges, we uh, are developing a project ESTEP right now, and um, within this project we have created a new tool to help um, disadvantaged adults. And uh, the importance and aim of this project is that the key competences and now i'm speaking the key competences especially digital and like communication according to european union those competences which are important nowadays uh, they are becoming uh, increasingly valuable and uh, they are really important uh, for people to make to have a meaningful life to fulfill themselves and not only in the a career, not only in further education, but also in generally social life. And um, within this project, we had uh, key activities, research, and then designing a training tool. And the research uh, uh, has the aim to learn about educational demands and challenges among the target group. And uh, as a result, uh, we have created a training syllabus with use of digital tools and learning and also key competences addressed uh, mainly digital and communication. So the research that we have done showed that the key competences which are quite important and quite challenging for disadvantages use are actually digital competences and digital education. And um, we we did it uh, with the research, which included an article. We studied our previous projects. We studied materials from Erasmus platform. And uh, we did uh, 
so-called field interviews uh, and field studies. Uh, we interviewed 25 adults in Sweden and uh, uh, totally we had uh, 100 interviewers and 20 experts interviewed in four countries and those countries are Sweden, France, Greece and Germany. And as a conclusion of those interview and research, we identified the needs for the learning outcomes, or so to say, the most critical and important key competences, which are the challenge for those learners. And we find out, found out that um, the important competences and skills when it comes to digital education for young adults are uh, is, is to know the range of strategies when searching for information because uh, it um, may be obvious for us and we can think that it's quite easy to find some information online but actually to do it in the correct and effective way uh, you need to use some strategies and you need to know how you are searching and especially if you are searching in some specific field like academic or research or some kind of specialty and also it's important for young people to know how to critically analyze information online. There are so many fake news and disinformation. We need to know how to be critical. And also it's important to use new tools and methods comfortably. For example, if uh, you're using some new digital tools in uh, uh, your learning course, uh, you need to know how it works. And it's important to uh, at uh, some kind of introduction for each course on how to how this and or another digital use tool is to be used and it's important also about uh, effective uh, lifelong learning online and our training modules included 25 workshops and four modules they are all free of charge and uh, are open we have um, a drop box uh, uh, folder with them. We have not done it uh, yet in the website, like in interactive form. They are just in documents, but they are free to use and uh, I can share them. And some uh, examples of our workshops are, uh, for example, we are having a quiz about Google and uh, this quiz includes questions about searching techniques in Google and uh, you mark in this quiz uh, if you have a uh, uh, correct answer or not and uh, the quiz will give some kind of point and show uh, how well are you in like searching in google also we have uh, the workshop in uh, cyber security uh, and there we talk about how to make your online space secure and uh, how uh, not to be targeted for cyber attacks or for some kind of frauds online. And uh, also we are talking about how to be critical online, how to understand fake news, how uh, to be able to spot uh, the disinformation online and um, memory strategies for learning online because it's completely different uh, nowadays uh, when everything is uh, in a computer it's not so often with it's not so common with uh, traditional memorizing techniques where learners could write down some information or take some notes uh, online it's completely different and how can we build those strategies to memorize and learn new things and there are many other workshops like that and uh, after creating these uh, workshops, we have validated our training program with 20 participants in Sweden and 20 participants in each other uh, country. And uh, we had quite good statistics. 75% of uh, uh, participants reported that they increased their knowledge actually in the digital learning and their digital skills has increased. Uh, and uh, how do we... Um, like approach this uh, more generally we have uh, drawn some conclusions from our work and our activities in this project and uh, we can make uh, like general conclusions are that we have to make even more research we have to study this all the time because this is such a new field and uh, it uh, has um, 
uh, it came quite quickly into the educational field uh, with COVID and well, with all those uh, latest trends. So it became uh, much more quickly with digital approach than we have um, maybe anticipated. So we need to continue to do research and to find out um, what are the challenges, what are we already strong in, and uh, share experiences, share best practices. Um, and also, uh, it's important to create a syllabus or some kind of a training about digital skills. It's something that we need just not just to assume that everyone knows it, but actually to train about it. And also it's important to include some kind of introductions when the new training starts and to embrace and realize that the digital future is here already and we need just to approach it in some way. So thank you. It was my presentation. Uh, do you have any questions or I will... Uh, Thank you okay. very much. Uh, well, I will not. Thank you. It was a really valuable uh, presentation, but I will not rush participants into the questions because we are a little bit out of time. So thank you okay, very yeah. much. Uh, I will uh, directly invite uh, Natalia. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Oh, now I hear that the sound is uh, all right. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Natalia, here is your presentation. Uh, thank okay. you very much uh, for your teamwork and commitment uh, to present uh, the financial literacy case uh, to young people. So uh, here you are. Uh, I will follow your presentation, but if you want me, you know, to move the slide in a certain point, then just uh, say to me. If, okay. Uh, if I get lost, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry for, for this inconvenience with the internet, but now I'm on fixed router internet and I hope everything will be okay now. Uh, thank you for the, the opportunity to say something about financial literacy of young people because I consider it a very important uh, uh, topic. And uh, today uh, I will show you the, the, the basis, let's say, the overview of the new curriculum that we are implementing in Croatia uh, schools, school by school, uh, because, it's, because of its importance. It's uh, not official yet, so it's not that every school has it in its curriculum, but I have to emphasize the importance of the work of Association Stedopis, which helps us a lot to improve our teacher skills and to create new lessons on digital literacy and the financial literacy of young people. Uh, we can move the slide now, uh, and I would like to ask you, um, what does financial literacy mean? You can write maybe in a chat, what does financial literacy means to you? How would you um, describe it? Or what concepts do we associate with financial literacy? If you have an, any idea, just share it in the chat. If not, I can continue. We can see it also on this slide uh, in a little picture that it's a budget, finance, cash, saving, fund, expenses, counting. There are so many, so many concepts, so many things that we can, we can consider parts of financial literacy. And what would financial literacy be? It, it is combination, in fact, of knowledge, skills, attitudes and behaviors needed to make the right financial decisions and for the financial well-being of each individual and thus the society as well. Uh, we have wise spending, yes, Jana, thank you, definitely wise, wise spending. And um, uh, so many times when I talk to my students and when I ask them um, what concepts do they associate with financial literacy, they, they always said a salary, a salary, a credit card. Those are the, the, the things that they uh, usually say when we talk about financial literacy. But um, I would like you first to see one video. It's in a slide before this one. It's an interesting video that they like very much. 
Uh, could you could you pass this video maybe? Mm -hmm. oh. I will have to sorry because I shared the slide and when you share the slide and not the screen then the links uh, disappeared in okay, the I will, yeah. I will I will put it in a chat so that you can share it with the others. Here it is. It's very short one, but interesting. Here it is. Okay, thank you. I will. Yeah, I just shared the. Uh, link but you can go on with your presentation yeah okay so um in this video you would you would see how uh, how uh, the father explains to his son um what is the budgeting and uh, he teaches him about this uh, financial literacy in a very very interesting way that um, uh, students uh, understand the best uh, i would like to continue um until this video starts about the objectives in the framework of student financial literacy. Uh, they are supposed to, to uh, acquire the knowledge and skills for responsible money management, to distinguish between different financial products, to develop uh, a long-term and sustainable financial plan in accordance with the wishes and abilities of students, to develop the ability to think critically about their finances, to, to, to protect themselves against financial risk, and to use digital tools for financial literacy. Those are the objectives that we are trying to put into our new uh, school curriculum about uh, financial literacy. And um, for the first year that I was doing it, I, I would say that we succeeded in, in doing it. But I hope that um, little by little, uh, it would become an official curriculum and that all the students would have an opportunity to, to uh, learn about it. Noama, Noama is saying that financial literacy is the ability to understand and apply different financial skills effectively, including personal financial management, budgeting, and saving. Yes, Noama, thank you. Definitely, that would be that would be a good, a good uh, definition of financial literacy. Uh, there's uh, something very interesting that I would like to share with you. It's um, it's global uh, global um, statistics. It's um, it's um, global Finland survey where um, here it is yes it's a map map of global variations in financial literacy and um, we could we could see here that they say that the person is defined as financially literate when he or she correctly answers at at least three out of the four financial concepts um, which are which are um risk diversification inflation numeracy interest and compound interest and um, those are uh, the the basics uh, of um, of what people were responding in this survey and uh, based on this definition 30 percent of adults worldwide are financially literate. This means that around 3.5 billion adults globally, most of, most of them in developing economies, lack an understanding of basic financial concepts. Um, the survey showed that um, 44 percentage of people in Croatia uh, are um, financially literate and we were happy to see that we are over this um, this 30 percentage. Uh, these global figures um, uh, could um, those disparities around the world are shown in this map as as you can see the most of people are in this this bright bright blue color so it's among 
35 to 44, uh, uh, 29 to 34 percentage. Uh, okay, we can continue because we are in shortage of time and say something about uh, why, um, why it matters, why financial literacy matters. It matters because of improvement. It helps us to improve our financial knowledge, financial behavior and our attitudes towards spending money. That's why I'm so happy that my students um, this school year for the first time have, have an opportunity to improve their level of financial and digital literacy in, in their high school. Uh, there are a few basic concepts. Uh, there are four of them. Basic concepts, parameters, uh, determin determinants of financial literacy that are on the another slide that you could show us. You can move the slide, Blanca. Yes, here it is. Uh, first of all, is personal budget. Uh, personal budget, uh, we are trying in this part of, uh, of um, a concept to, to teach students about di distinguishing budget items, distinguish between net and gross wages and salary items. Uh, we are trying to make them develop a plan on daily, weekly and monthly basis or their personal or family plan and to make them uh, develop a personal budget guide. Another concept is forms of in investment. You can go further, Blanca. One more. In this concept uh, of uh, forms of investment, they are comparing different ways of smart money management. They're exploring the advantages and disadvantages of different investment opportunities, and they are developing a guide for types of investments. On the third concept with card business, they are distinguishing the use of, you can move the, the slide, Distinguish, they are distinguishing the use and capabilities of certain types of cards they are distinguishing the use and possibilities of account types, and they are explaining the functions of internet banking, so distinguishing types of access to internet banking and the use of demo versions of internet banking, and they are also at the end developing a guide for the types of card businesses and the use of internet banking. Uh, they they really like uh, the this concept, card business, because many of them have their own cards, student cards, uh, where the parents put the money and that they can spend only the amount that they have on it. And it's interesting that, um, that they are very, very able to, to use internet banking and that uh, they, they know a lot about um, different uh, types of cards. And this is the concept that, they, that is most popular among uh, my students. And the last concept is crediting. In this concept, we are trying to um, make them explain basic credit terms to access credit risks compare the advantages and disadvantages of certain types of loans, uh, the access of cost effect effectiveness of raising a loan in a particular currency, and at the end again, to develop a guide to basic credit terms. Those four concepts um, uh, we, are, uh, we are developing as, uh, as lessons, and we are uh, doing it through the school year. And... Um, this was just the overview of something that we are um, uh, doing for the first time in our schools. But um, because of shortage of time, I just made this overview. But I hope that some other time I could show you various student assignments that we use uh, while learning and improving student financial literacy and to show you the, the, result, the results of their, of, their, of their assignments. I hope that... Uh, we didn't took too much of your time. And uh, for now, this is be just the introduction of this uh, financial li literacy curriculum that we are uh, trying to, to make official in our schools in Croatia. 
I think you are doing a really great job because uh, this is usually, you know, left in the family, but it's yes. such an important topic and it has yes. a strong impact in to every, every person's life. So good luck uh, to implement as soon as possible. Uh, okay. And this, uh, so this was uh, the 23rd conference uh, on digital education today. Thank you very much. Uh, our next conference is in the last day of March, 31st uh, March. So you can apply at erasmuspluscourses.com. Please do so. Uh, so the link for the certificate uh, is posted several times into the comments. Uh, we will go through all the uh, requests and provide the certificates within the, uh, five days. So be patient and check also your spam box uh, or the commercial box. Okay, I hope so to see you on the next conference and goodbye to all of you.